Every moment of your life matters. All nations. You need your Jesus. You need to elevate the kingdom of God wherever you go. You have something to be thankful for. So make your lifestyle one that glorifies God. Be born again is to be birthed into the kingdom. The, the, the Christian life seems to be the one in which we live in the very presence of God. I have a word for everyone here today. Are you ready for the word of God? I said, are you ready for the word of God? I believe it's a now word. Hallelujah. It's a word in season. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody say the word is coming. And the word is good. Say, I love the word. The word is bread. The word is meat. The word is meat. The word is honey. The word is... What is the guy going to say? The word is life. The word is healing. Praise God. Father, thank you so much for your presence. I ask for the unction, Father, of the Holy Spirit to speak forth the oracles of God today. Thank you that the word you have placed in my heart, it will fulfill your purpose in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for every heart that is gathered here. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name for receptive hearts to your word today. Receptive hearts that they will receive the incorruptible seed of the word. It will bear fruits to the honor and the glory of your holy name. So thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all the people together said, Amen. Amen. The theme of this conference, in a sense, is mighty men of valor. Mighty men of valor. Really, it's mighty men or women of valor. Mighty people of valor. Mighty persons of, of valor. And I believe today that the Lord wants to ask you this question. What do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? I want you to turn to somebody and say, what do you have in your hand? Ask them, what do you have in your hand? You see, when God gets ready to do something on this earth, he always looks for a person. Always. Remember when he, he wanted to make sure that he would cut a covenant with a, a person so that the Messiah, the seed of Abraham would come. He looked for Abraham. He looked for Abraham. He looked for Moses when he wanted to bring deliverance to his people when they were in bondage. When he wanted to deliver his people from the Philistines or the Amalekites, Amalekites and all those folks. He always looked for somebody. That's why you have the judges. You have Samson. You have Gideon. You have people like that. He always looks for somebody. In fact, the Bible says the Lord is looking throughout the earth. His eyes are roaming throughout the earth. In the book of 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. He's looking. So as he looks across the earth, he looks at North America. He looks at the United States. He looks at Texas. He looks at Round Rock. Looking for somebody to do something through. Show himself strong to. Hallelujah. When he's getting ready to do something, he always looks for a man. Looks for a Deborah. Looks for an Esther. Looks for somebody. Because God is in heaven. And this is, and we, the human beings, he looks for somebody on this earth to use. So when God got ready to deliver his people from the, the bondages of the Midianites, this was in the time of Gideon. He looked for a leader. He looked for a man of valor. Somebody who didn't think he was a man of valor, but somebody who was a man of valor in the eyes of God. And the Bible says Gideon was that person he chose to be that leader, to be that deliverer for his people. And he said to Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, you've got the wrong man. Me? I am the least in my father's house. Me? My clan is the, is the least in the tribe of, of Manasseh. You've got the wrong man. But God continued to speak to him, to encourage him, to reassure him. And then he says to Gideon in the book of Judges 6.14. When he's commissioned him, he says, look, Gideon, I know you've got all these excuses. You are saying you are weak. You are wondering whether they are, what, where are the miracles. I, I, I know all your excuses. Then he says this, go with the strength you have. Go with the strength you have. And he says, rescue Israel from the Midianites. And then God says, I am sending you. Glory to God. The I am God was sending him. 
This is the commission he gave you. He says, look, you go with the strength you have. You think you are weak. You think you, you are the least. You go with the strength you have. Why? Because God was going to be with him. He was not going to fulfill it in his own strength. God was going to be with him. And that's why he says, I am with you. He said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Many times God looks at us when he's looking at the earth and he sees women of valor. He sees men of valor. He sees people of valor, but the people don't realize it. They still look at themselves, oh, no, 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 no. They're talking about Pastor Richard. They're talking about, about T.D. Jakes. They're talking about somebody else. It's not me. God sees you, and he sees you with destiny and purpose. Can you say amen? amen. Have you ever wished that you had more in this life? Have you ever wished that you had more money in this life? And you say, oh, if I had this amount of money, I'll be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Have you ever wished that you could sing, you know, like the doc here, you could sing and lead worship, or you could do this and do that, or you had certain gifts and talents. Have you ever wished you were, you were from the good school, hallelujah, you know, that you went to the best school around, or you went to Harvard or Yale, Many times we wish we were taller or smarter or, 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 or more beautiful or had an advantage. All these things we wish we had. That we had better opportunities in life. But the truth is, it's not so much what you have. Those things don't matter. It's not so much what you don't have, I beg your pardon. It's what you have. God looks for what you have, not what you don't have. What, he's not looking for what you don't have. The interesting thing is this. In the Bible, he does extraordinary things through people who have very little. Hallelujah. Very little. He will do extraordinary things so that he gets all the glory. That's why the Bible says he takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He, com he takes the weak to confound the strong. Ah, because he wants his glory. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give you a few examples here because God is asking you this question. What do you have in your hand? There is something God has placed in the inside of you. There is a gift. There is a talent. There is something that you are not regarding as important that God has placed inside of you and he wants to use it anyway. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you remember the rod of Moses in the book of Exodus? I'll give you a bit of background. The Hebrew people were in Egypt. They had been there for over 400 years. They were in terrible bondage. Even though they went to Egypt and they had favor through Joseph, now they were oppressed as slaves. They were the main workforce of the Egyptian empire. And it was bad. It was difficult. It was a trying time. And the Bible says, in desperation, they started crying out to God, saying, Lord, help us. Lord, deliver us. They were crying out to God for rescue, for him to show his face. 400 years in slavery is not a joke. And the Bible says that God looked for a man, and the man was Moses. He was in Midian. He was all the way in the Midian territory. And here he is looking after his father's sheep. Not all, even his own sheep. His father-in-law's sheep. He's looking after his father-in-law's sheep for 40 years. Moses was in Midian because he ran away. He ran away from Egypt because he had killed a man. Now, by the way, those of you who know the story, Moses grew up in the palace. Pharaoh's daughter looked after him. Then he identified himself. No, he said, realized that, no, he's a Hebrew. So he identified himself to the Hebrews. He saw somebody more treating one of the slaves and he killed that person. And so he had to run away. So he's been in Midian for 40 years. And then God says, okay, these people have been crying out to me. It's time. And he has this encounter at the burning bush. Hallelujah. And at the burning bush, the bush is burning. The bush is on fire, but it's not burning. It's an encounter with Almighty God. And then God begins to give him a commission, an assignment. And he says to Moses, I'm, I'm actually sending you to be a deliverer. I'm sending you to, bring, to rescue my people. Oh, sometimes you, you don't realize that you're the one. Moses was looking after his father-in-law's sheep, but he was the one. You may think that you had a dead-end job at McDonald's, but you are the one. You are the one. God is looking for you. 
You may think that, oh, I, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a, a doctor. You are the one. You may be cleaning some place. You are the one. Hallelujah. And I'm saying it not just to stroke your ego. The Bible says it. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts and the plans I have for you. Plans of what? Good, not of evil. To give you a future and a hope, an, ex an expectation of something positive coming to you. Job chapter 8, verse 7 says that, Though your beginnings were small, your latter days will, ex will, will increase greatly. Increase greatly. Oh, folks, you have to know that it doesn't matter how you start. It's how you finish. Moses was looking after his father-in-law's sheep, not even his own sheep. And then he had an encounter with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God asked him, gives him this commission. It seems like an impossible commission. Here he is in Midian. He says, I want you to go back to Egypt. And I want you to go back to Egypt, the most powerful nation on earth at the time. And he says, I want you to give a message to the most powerful man. And the message is a simple message. He says, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. That was the message. And now you can imagine Moses. What are you talking about? Don't you know where I am? I don't have an army. I don't have any other strategy. I don't have weapons. I am not a diplomat. And he starts giving excuses. I can't talk. You know I can't talk. And he's, say, you know, he's, he's telling God that he's got the wrong man. But God keeps on encouraging this man. And carry, gives him a few signs and so on. He's encouraging. And I want you to think about how enormous this task must have been to Moses. Must have been tough for him. Moses was not holding a sword like a general. Moses was not holding a scepter like a king. All he had was what? A rod. A shepherd rod. Oh, folks. You see, God asked Moses something. When he was trying to persuade him, when he was trying to encourage him, God asked Moses something. He said, what do you have in your hand? What do you have? Because Moses was given all the excuses. I don't have an army. I, you know, he was given all the excuses. It's not me. He says, what do you have? And he says, I have a rod. Just a shepherd's rod. The one I use to direct the sheep. The one I use to protect the sheep. I have a rod. That's all I have. But do you know the rod of Moses? It did exploits for God. Oh, somebody, you've got to hear me out today. You've got to hear me out today. You may got to hear me out today. Don't underestimate what God is going to do in your life. All Moses had was a rod and a word from God and a promise from God that he was going to be with him. That's all he had. A word from God, a promise from God, and then, of course, his rod. That's all he had. Don't underestimate a word from God. Don't underestimate a promise from God. I remember when I was down and out, I had gone to this conference in New Jersey. I'll never forget it. And I keep on saying it because it, it impacted my life. It changed my life. We had gone to this conference and at this conference, there were all these powerful men preaching. And at the time, I believed God had left me on the shelf because I, I, my ministry was like non-existent. Nothing was happening. And here I am in the congregation. And this man, uh, bless his heart, he's going to be with the Lord now, but he was leaving the stage. He comes back and says, somebody needs a word. And the word is from the book of Job. And you know, so, 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 if somebody tells you, <laughs> you need a word from the book of Job, who, who likes the book of Job that you want a word from Job? So straight away, I said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to. Then he gave the word from Job chapter 8 verse 7. He says, though your beginnings were small, your latter days will increase greatly. I'm telling you, something just switched in the inside of me. Just a word and a promise from God. Moses had a promise from God. He says, I'm going to be with you. He had a promise from God. He had a word from God. I want you to go. That's what he had. That's what Moses had. So what happened here? You see, God was concerned for the people of Israel because they were children of covenants through Abraham. Do you know that you are a covenant child? When God sees you, he sees you, but he also sees covenant. You are under the new covenant. And the Bible says it's a better covenant. 
It's a better covenant. With better promises. So when God sees you, he doesn't just see you as a person. He sees you and he sees his covenant. So God was getting ready now to respond to Moses. Hallelujah. And he said to Moses, what do you have in your hand? And he says, I have a rod. What do you have in your hand? What gift do you have? What talent do you have? What spiritual gift do you have? What has God placed in the inside of you? You see, Moses thought it was, it was insignificant. He thought it was, un, it was not impressive. And sometimes the thing God places inside of us, we think that it's not important. It's too little. But God is asking, what do you have? What do you have in your hand? God will always ask you for what you have. He won't ask you for what you don't have. Did you hear that? He will ask you for what you have, not what you don't have. He wants to use what you have. He, won't, he won't, doesn't want to use what you don't have. Hallelujah. So he asked Moses this question, and then he begins to encourage him, encourage him, encourage him, encourage him. You see, when there is something small, it doesn't matter how small it is, when it is surrendered to God, when you partner with God with that thing, suddenly the thing that is insignificant, it becomes significant. The thing that is natural and small, when God places his hand on it, it is supernatural. The thing that is ordinary, when God gets involved, it is extraordinary. Oh, somebody, turn to somebody and say, what do you have in your hand? When Moses' rod was surrendered to God, the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus chapter 4 and verse 20 that suddenly the Bible says that it became the rod of God. It was the rod of Moses. That was the staff of Moses. But suddenly the Bible begins to have that switch and it says it's the rod of God. There was a switch. Why? Because he surrendered what he had to God. And that rod began to do extraordinary things because of God. Because God's hand was with it on that rod. Hallelujah. That rod, and in fact, that rod of, of, of Aaron as well, it was, they were used by God to shake the, 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 the empire of Egypt. Rods, simple staff rods. So you see, for example, when Aaron, you know, when the plagues were coming and God was beginning to work on Pharaoh and beginning to, 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 to force him because he had a stubborn heart and he brought the plagues. Bible tells us that when, when Aaron, you know, he raised his staff and he struck the waters of the Nile, suddenly the waters of the Nile became blood. And all the rivers in the whole of Egypt were blood. All the streams, blood. There was blood everywhere. God just touched the rod of Aaron. That's what God did. And then he stretches his, his, hand, his, his rod again. This is Aaron. Up, up, upon the rivers and the, 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 the waters of, the, of, the, of, the, of Nile, and of, of Egypt. And what happens? This is the second plague. Frogs began to come out of the rivers and the, and the streams. Frogs. And the Bible says the frogs were on the land. They were in the houses, in the palaces, in, the, in, the, in their ovens, on their ovens, everywhere there were frogs. Who brought the frogs? Help me out. Who brought the frogs? Whose rod was it? Aaron. But God did the miracle. God took that simple rod and because he had sent them and they were obedient to him, he made the miracle happen. He did the extraordinary. He did the supernatural. But it was Aaron's rod. And then he stretches his rod again. He strikes the dust on the ground. And the gnats come out. Lice come out. And they are upon all the livestock. All the Egyptians. The rod of Aaron. And then you go to the rod of Moses, the rod of God. What happens here? The Bible says he stretches his arm to the heavens. And these are all plagues that came on Egypt. I'm just showing you the importance of something as, as so seemingly useless as a rod. He stretches this rod to the heavens. And now lightning comes out from the heavens. Thunder and hail. That was, that was Moses' rod. 
And then you go on and you see how Moses stretches his, his hand into the heavens again. And this time there's locusts that are coming across the whole of Egypt. But just in obedience to stretching forth his hand and his rod. And then when the finally Pharaoh agrees to let them go and he changes his mind, they're in front of the Red Sea and they are pursuing. And then God says to Moses, stretch forth your rod across the sea. And the Bible says uh, he stretched forth his rod across the sea and the, the sea parted. And he walked in the sea as on dry ground. As on dry ground. On dry ground. All the Israelites walked through. But just because he was obedient to God and look at what he had. His rod. His rod. His rod. They're in the wilderness. They're thirsty. They begin to complain. Have you brought us here to kill us? He doesn't know, he doesn't, he can't suddenly call Target or Walmart or whatever for water. They don't know where they're going to get the water from. And then God says, take the rod and strike the rock. And water comes out of that rock. And all the Israelites, they drink to their fill. Are you getting the picture here? The rod, the rod. And they're in battle against the Amalekites. And he's up on the hill and he lifts up his rod. And he notices that when the rod is lifted up, he's holding the rod up like that. They are prevailing against the Amalekites. When he gets tired and he drops it, he realizes the Amalekites are prevailing. So Ur uh, and Aaron, they, put, they let him sit down and then they support him. Aaron takes one arm and the other one takes the other. And they are trying to support that rod. That's why your pastor needs Ur's and Aaron's to support him. But it was the rod. The rod. What do you have in your hand? What talent? What so-called insignificant gifts do you have? God wants to use it for his glory. God wants to use it for his glory. God wants to use it for such a time as this. You've been born for such a time as this. We are in the last days, church. And God needs you. And everything he has placed inside of you. Look, Jesus operated the same way. Remember when the, he, he was teaching the people, the multitude, and there were, there were 5,000 men besides women and children. Some Bible scholars believe there were probably 10 to 15 to 20,000 people. 5,000 men besides women and children. They are hungry. He's concerned about them. And then he tells his disciples, let's give them something to you. So, well, you know, we can't. How can we do that? And then what happens? The Bible says that he used a little boy's lunch. Five loaves, two fish. Five loaves and two for 5,000 men besides women and children. Probably fifteen to 20,000 people. But what did Jesus do? He looked up to heaven and he prayed. And then he said, told his disciples, go and distribute it. And everyone ate to their fill. And there were how many basketball, basket full? Twelve baskets full of the leftovers. Five loaves, two fish was enough for God. He did it again when there were 4,000 men besides women and children. This time he took seven loaves and a few fish. He did the same thing. It was enough for God. And he fed them all. And there were seven baskets full after they collected the remnants. I'm just giving you the picture that God doesn't need much. He can use little. If you will entrust it to him. If you will partner with him. Hallelujah. Remember David and Goliath. The Bible just goes to great lengths to describe Goliath. He was about nine feet tall. He was, I believe he was Nephilim. He was a Nephilim in my view. But he was nine feet tall and describes his armor and all that. He had an armor bearer and all that kind of stuff. And all the professional soldiers from Israel, they were quaking in their boots. They were afraid because this guy was a champion. Then David comes on the scene. I'm not, I'm not going to give you the whole story. You know the story. But what did God use? 
one stone. One stone. He took five. God needed one. And he was able to slay Goliath with a stone. With a stone. I want you to get this picture that God is asking you, what do you have in your hand? Remember the widow of Zarephath in the days of Elijah when there's this famine. It hasn't rained for three and a half years. And initially God is providing for Elijah with the ravens and the, uh, the brook. And now he says, okay, I've sent you to a widow. And she, I've commanded her to give you something to, to take care of you, to sustain you. So he goes there and he meets this widow who is gathering sticks for her last meal. All she had was a little oil and some flour. And she says, I'm going to just cook my meal. And me and my son, we're going to die after that. That's all she had. Then the man of God gives the word. And she, by faith, accepts the word. And that little oil and the flour is sustained her, her son, and Elijah throughout the rest of the famine. That's all God needed. That's all God needed. What do you have in your hand? Remember that desperate widow who had married a prophet? The prophet was in debt. He died. Goes to Elisha, the prophet. He says, this is the situation. The creditors are coming for my sons. She didn't know what to do. And then it's very interesting. First Kings chapter 4. I want you to listen to this. First Kings chapter 4, verse 2. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 2. Is it Second Kings? Okay. He said, he said, this is what he says, what do you have in the house? Okay, 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2. He asked this question, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maid servant has nothing. I want you to take note of what she said. Just, I don't have anything. And then she adds, I don't have anything in the house but a jar of oil. <laughs> the question was, what do you have? And she looks and says, I don't have anything. I only have a jar of oil. Just a jar of oil. That's all she had. And what did the man of God do? What did God do? He used that little oil, that little jar of oil. He commanded her to go and borrow from her, their neighbors. He said, don't borrow a few jars. Borrow. And you just keep pouring. And as she was pouring that little oil that she said is nothing, is nothing, is nothing. He kept on pouring that oil. That all the jars began to be full till there were no more jars. And she sold the jars of oil. And God took her out of debt. That is what she had. But she entrusted it to God. God partnered with her. The ordinary became extraordinary. So when you look at yourself, if somebody asked you, what do you have? What would you say? Would you just belittle some of the precious things God has placed inside of you? If you do that, then you are limiting God's move in your life. Because if you can use a rod, if you can use five loaves and two fish or seven loaves and a few fish, if you can use a little oil and a little flour to sustain all these people, how much more the gift that is inside of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Samson. You know the judge Samson. I love the story of Samson. Bible says that he was able to kill 1,000 Philistines with a jawbone of a lion, of a donkey. That's right. A jawbone of a donkey. What's your name? What's your name? Obisa. Obi. Obi. Okay. May the Lord continue to grant you the word of God to bubble in the inside of you. May it become sweeter and sweeter in Jesus' name. May it come out of your mouth. May the life that comes from your mouth in Jesus' name, may it affect lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. The jawbone of a donkey. That's what he used. Because the Holy Spirit, you see, and the, God is careful about his glory. He says the Holy, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. That is the trick. It was not the, the jawbone of the donkey that did it. The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. There's another judge a lot of people don't know about him. He's called Shamga. Shamga, it sounds like some Ghanaian food. <laughs> Called Shamga. Shamga was able to deliver Israel from the Philistines and he killed 600 men with, a, with a, an ox goad. An ox goad is like a stick that is pointed that is used to direct ox. Are you getting the picture? What do you have in your hand? 
Oh, glory to God. Then you come to Gideon. Gideon was somebody who was not confident. He was a coward. He was, he was threshing wheat in the wine press. And so Gideon is threshing wheat. He's trying to hide from the Midianites. Then God comes and says, oh, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. He says, oh, no, you've got it wrong. I'm the least of my, in, the, in, my, in my family. He says, my clan is the least in Manasseh. No, you've got it wrong. And he says, where are the miracles of God? He brought us out of it. Why don't we see it now? He's giving all these excuses. And God is still pressing. I want to send you, Gideon. I have work for you to do. And he's trying to press him. He's trying to encourage him. And then he says to him, very clearly, you go with the strength that you have. Just go with the strength that you have. Whatever you have, whatever little strength, whatever um, minute strength you have, you go with that. Go with that. Oh, folks, God wants you to go with the strength that you have. God wants you to go with the strength that you have. Sometimes we think that we have nothing. And you are looking, based, you are looking at the word of, you are looking at your bank account is in the red. You're looking at your savings account, non-existent. You're looking at the income that's coming in, very little. You say, I have nothing. And you can say, I genuinely have nothing. That is a lie from the pit of hell. If you can speak, you have your words. The Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. You see, a lot of us, we think it's insignificant. But there is life in your mouth. There is death in your mouth. You can curse certain things like death or cancer. You can curse it. Don't curse people. Leave that to God. Amen. I, I don't want to go on that tangent. But you can curse things that need to be cursed like cancer, like death, like poverty. You can do that by taking the word of God and declaring my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You see, when you have the word of God, the promise of God inside of your mouth and you declare it, your situation has to change. But a lot of us, we don't think the word of God is powerful. So we don't meditate on the word of God. We don't speak the word of God. What do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? I'm here to encourage you, to let you know that God has placed inside of you all that you will need to fulfill your destiny in him. God has placed inside of you the things that you need, that you, um, that you need to be a part of what he's doing across the earth, building his church. God has placed you in this house, in this church for such a time as this. There is something inside of you that this church needs. This church needs. The Bible says he has given all of us, if you are born again, he has given you a gift for the edification of the body. That is the building up of the body. So if you are a believer, God has placed something inside of you that is for this house or the people you come in contact with. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's time for you to acknowledge before God. Lord, you know what? I didn't realize this, but you've given me this gift. Sometimes it's easy to, act, to see some gifts like a voice, an ability to lead worship, and lead to play the piano. All that kind of stuff. Or, uh, 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 the leadership gifts. You can see. But there are things that God has placed inside of us. Some of you, God has placed the ability to just cook. And that is, is going to be used by God. You know, there's a lady in our church. Bless her heart. When you come to the church and she smiles, it's like your troubles will go away. She would just smile. Welcome to River of Life. And many people have testified. Just a smile. A smile. Some of you, you've got smiles that you are holding back. Maybe you are the person that needs to help be an usher or a greeter. When somebody comes and says, welcome to the best church in the world. Amen. And that smile alone will put them at ease. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes, are you hearing what I'm saying? God wants to encourage you today. There is something inside of you that he wants you to bring out. Look, let me give you this. I'm going to close now. Actually, I've got 11 minutes. Well, praise God. But I want to just wrap this up by sharing this testimony because I believe this is where God was directing me as I was sharing about what you have in your hand. In the 1949, November of 1949, there was a tremendous revival that broke up in the Hebrides, the Isle of Lewis. 
the Hebrides are a group of islands, about 40 different islands off the west coast of Scotland. Okay, the Hebrides. When you go back, check out the revival in, in the Hebrides. But it's interesting how that revival started. In fact, the, the, the main hand or the main lead person for, for, for this revival was a guy called Duncan Campbell. Powerful man of God. Powerful man of God. And many times when you hear about the Hebrides revival, you hear of Duncan Campbell. And many times people would invite him and he was always careful to show how the revival started. It started with two women. Two women. One of them was 84 years old. They were sisters. The second woman was 82 years old. Their names, Peggy and Christine Smith. Peggy Smith was stone blind. She couldn't see. 84 years old. Christine Smith. She suffered from crippling arthritis. Two women. God just placed his burden in their hearts. Two women living in a small, humble cottage. He placed his burden in their hearts. He said, why don't we see young people in our church? That was the burden. So you know what? Yes, they could, one person couldn't see. But God didn't, didn't need her to see. Naturally. The other person was suffering from crippling arthritis. What did those two women have? They had some time and they had a bed. So they decided that they were going to start praying on Tuesdays and Fridays from about 10 a.m. to 4 a, uh, 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Just Tuesdays and Fridays. These women began to devote themselves to prayer. That's what they had. And as they were praying, they were praying, they were praying. Then God gave a vision to Peggy, a vision of a whole ch of a church full of young people. So she was encouraged. So she called her pastor and said, Pastor, I believe God wants to do something in the Hebrides. Some, God wants to do something on the island of Lewis. I want to encourage you. L let's start praying. Let's start interceding. So the pastor took, thankfully he knew there were godly women. He said, okay, let's do that. Soon they started praying on Tuesdays and on Fridays. Same time from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. And then soon, seven men said, we're going to commit to this. They sensed that God was still going to do something. So they began to pray. They began to pray. They began to pray. The church began to pray. It started with two women. One blind. The other crippled with arthritis. And as they were praying, they had a, a sense to call this Duncan Campbell. And initially when he got the message, you know, he says, no, 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 no. He was at a conference. He said, no, I'm not coming. I'm at the conference. And the Holy Spirit said, get up and go. So he got up and he wept. He left the conference. He left his assignment at the conference. He says, the Holy Spirit said I should go. So he went all the way to the island of Lewis. He gets there and they are still praying. And things are beginning to change in that, in that, on that island. There's more of a consciousness of God. People are talking about God more and more. You know, things, you know there's an awareness of God. And as they are praying, they still don't see a move. And then one day they have a prayer meeting. Duncan Campbell is there. And as they have this prayer meeting, they need encouragement because they are not seeing any results. So they pray, they pray, they pray. After the prayer meeting, Duncan Campbell dismisses everybody. And there's only one deacon left. And he says, Pastor, says to Duncan Campbell, don't be discouraged. I know God is moving. I can sense it. And then he goes into a trance. The man goes into a trance. And as he's in this trance, there's a knock on the door, the church door. And the blacksmith of that community, he a believer, he comes rushing in. And as he rushes, comes and says, Duncan Campbell, Duncan Campbell, you're not going to believe this. We've been praying that God will pour his river, his waters, the Holy Spirit on dry ground. And it's happening. And he says, what do you mean by that? He said, you're not going to believe it. Come and see, come and see, come and see. Duncan Campbell goes to the entrance, the door of the, the entrance of the church, goes to the door. Outside are 600 to 700 people. This is 11 p.m. Hungry for God. Just like that. People were sleeping and then the Holy Spirit would stare their hearts. Get up and go to church. They would dress up and go to the church. The accounts of how young people 
they were at a, a, a nightclub, you know, they were dancing, enjoying themselves. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit begins to convict them of sin. They stop. They leave the dance floor. The dance floor is empty. And they all find their way to church. It started with two women. Two women. And then suddenly revival broke out. Churches were beginning to fill up. There was prayer meetings. People were convicted of sin. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There's a story of this woman who's a Christian and her husband was a farmer and this guy was a mean, wicked husband. Always trying to prevent her from going to church. And when the Holy Spirit began to move, he convicted this man. And it said that for three days, this man was crying out to God, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. For three days. This woman was, was coming back with some friends, some other Christians, and they saw the husband in the farm. Said, oh, let, let's, go and st- let, let's go and minister. Said, no, 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 don't minister. The way he has treated me. Let the Holy Spirit work on him. For three days, he's crying out, Lord, have mercy on me. Assemblies of God, all nations, church. Round tree, round, round rock, round rock, Texas. My message to you is that you have something that can change your community. You have a gift. I tell you, things happen when you partner with God. The Bible says, with God, all things are possible. But it is for us to say, Lord, I partner with you. And one of the ways we do that is through prayer. What would happen if we started praying as a church? Yes, it's inconvenient sometimes, but that's what it takes. Sometimes it means you have to wake up early in the morning. Right now, bless God, we have Zoom. We can connect easily. What would happen if all of us started saying, you know what? We want to see a move in in, in this community, in Round Rock. What would happen? What would happen if we started praying for the schools? Praying for the, you know, against the nonsense that is being taught in schools. What would happen if we started praying for the universities around? Praying for our leaders. Church, sometimes what we have is prayer. We have, you see, you and I, we have access to God. We have access through prayer. You have access through prayer. Husbands, you have access as a, as a priest of your home. To cry out for your children. We have access to cry out for our our, our places of employment. You have access to say, Lord, bless my business. Lord, bless the business I'm working for. Convict them with the Holy Spirit and power. Convict them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. You have access to God through prayer. But you know what? Prayer is one of the things in the church that that they, they don't take seriously. I'm not talking about this church. Generally, prayers, if you have a barbecue, glory to God. Everybody is going. I've heard about round rock ribs. Hallelujah. You know, everybody will go for that. But when he says, let's meet together at 11 to pray, then all the excuses in the the book are there. But you have access. I have access. We have access. What would happen if we started praying about the election? What would happen if we started praying about, 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 about the church expansion and growth and the anointing of the Holy Spirit? What would happen? God will respond. Because he wants it more than you and I do. Oh, church, God wants it more than you and I do. There was a powerful move in Hebrides. And if you, listen, if you go on YouTube, there are so many accounts. It will encourage your faith. But what encouraged me most about it, it started with two elderly women. It it doesn't seem like there'll be much that will come out of their lives. Two elderly, 84, blind, 82, crippled with arthritis. And yet they went before the Heavenly Father. So what do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? What gifts? Your gift is needed. It's needed by God. Is needed by God. You have been born for such a time as this. God has you here on earth for a purpose. God has you in this city for a purpose. 
The book of Jeremiah tells us that he wants us to pray to seek out the prosperity of the city that he has placed us in. And by the way, that Jeremiah chapter 29 where it says, I know the plans I have for you. They were in exile. They didn't want to be there. And God said, you pray for the city. I know we have goals, we have agendas. I'm asking you today, hook up to God's agenda. He wants the lost to be saved. And he needs somebody. He needs you. There are people in your sphere of influence. You are the one that is supposed to be a light and to talk to them. The pastor can't be at your workplace. Can't be at the restaurant. You are it. There are people who are hurting. People who, are, who need healing. Hands. That's another thing. You see, our hands don't seem to be important. Seems little. He has given all of us hands. What does the Bible say? Those who believe will lay hands on the sick. So even if you have hands, God has given you something to represent him. People are sick. People are struggling. People are emotionally drained. People are depressed. You are it for the kingdom. The Bible says he lifts up the poor and the needy from the dunghill and from the ashes to seat them with princes. How does he do it? Through his people. Oh, I just want to encourage you. You have something that God has placed in the inside of you. And God wants to use it. God is looking for men and women of valiance. Hallelujah. People who are going to be strong and bold and courageous. Who are willing to trust him. That even though they have something small, they will give it to God. And God will use it for something big. Oh, I tell you. Families need you. Some of our families, they are unsaved. Some of our families, they are atheists or agnostic. God needs you to pray for the people. So assemblies of God. The Bible says, in the day of his power, God is looking for willing volunteers. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to stand in the gap and pray? Are you willing to support your pastors? Are you willing to give what he instructs you to give? Are you willing to be the light in the darkness? Are you willing to be the salt wherever he places you? Are you willing to be the voice, his voice? where he has placed you to bring a word of hope to people who are despairing. Are you willing? Folks, he's looking. His eyes are to and fro, looking, 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 looking. He's looking over Africa. He's looking over Asia. He's looking over Europe. He's looking over North America. He's looking over the U.S. Looking over Texas. He's looking over Round Rock. And as he looks, does he find you? Does he find you? Does he find you? Why don't we just stand up together?